the Democratic Party is beefing up its arsenal to fend off third-party candidates that it views is a threat to President Biden's re-election bid. Now, according to the New York Times, Democrats are enlisting an army of attorneys, including Biden's former White House counsel, Dana Remus. They will be tasked with tracking the growing threat, according to them, from these third-party candidates, particularly, of course, RFK Jr., whose campaign is picking up momentum. Latest polling conducted by The Hill shows Trump at 40.5 percent nationally, Biden at 38.6 percent, and RFK Jr. at 9.8 percent. Mm. The establishment has brushed off third parties, but increasingly... And efforts from independent candidates like RFK Jr. and Cornell West, plus groups like No Labels and the Green Party to gain ballot access, is stoking angst within the party, especially with disruption in recent elections, including in 2016, which many people say Jill Stein, the Green Party candidate, drew votes away from Hillary Clinton, contributing to her loss against Trump. Many other people say that Hillary Clinton was never going to get some of those votes. A recent Vox News national poll found RFK Jr. drew 13 percent support and averaging 6 percent in Georgia, pulling votes from Trump and Biden equally. The insurgent candidate is on one state ballot, Utah, and has enough signatures to get ballot access in New Hampshire, Hawaii and Nevada. So this was a really fascinating article. I I'm glad they did it, um, focusing on Biden, Team Biden's um, terror uh, over third party groups and efforts to basically just bog them down in the legal process at whatever term they can, hire attorneys to, you know, contest signatures, cont find arcane applications of ballot access rules and just make life as difficult as possible for RFK Jr., the Green Party, no labels, the libertarians, et cetera, um, when, where, and when applicable. Um, interestingly, in the, the article kind of suggests that Team Biden really thought no labels was going to be the big threat. Mm -hmm. No labels has very much fizzled out. They're not going to field a candidate with any name recognition whatsoever. So that's not really the threat. Their threat, they perceive, is RFK Jr., yeah. who, despite having a lot of, um, I, I think, our, uh, fans that he's drawn in from the right, is still, according to polls, seeming to pull a little bit more from Biden, although, according to the polls, he really does take from both. Um, so, so there's that. Uh, you know, obviously the narrative every election cycle is, oh, they would have won, but for Joe Jorgensen or Jill Stein or whoever it is, and you and I uh, are united in rolling minute. our eyes at but, that. Do they say? Do they blame libertarians? Because oh, I feel absolutely. like they. Ne I never hear Republicans whining about libertarians the way Democrats oh. whine about the Green Party. Oh, trust. Oh, oh. Because oh, libertarians God, always get friend. so many more votes than the Green Party candidate. And if you were to actually take third parties out evenly, it, it would have, it, it would have, constantly. It's presuming the Green Party people would vote for Democrats and the libertarians would vote for Republicans. Is, it would help Republicans. Right. I mean, I, I don't know that. It would, I, I, th I tend to think people who vote third party really might not vote. A lot of them I agree. would not vote I agree for that. the two major candidates. They could, they could write in some the, the right. exact person you're preventing them from voting. If you held a gun to their head and forced them to choose, I bet that would be pr pretty very democratic. Um, <laughs> I, I right. highly doubt that a lot of the third party voters actually would get picked up in significant numbers by the major parties. And, and I don't want to skip over the mechanisms by which the Democratic Party historically has managed to attack third parties. The so-called party that says it's going to withhold democracy going into 2024 has a long history of challenging the ballot signatures that third parties need and which is, are very, very expensive to get in order to even get on the ballot. This was a huge issue with Matthew Ho's Green Party Senate campaign in North Carolina in the 2020 two cycle, where his campaign was able to go over uh, and, uh, and above in getting way more signatures than were required, but they faced a uh, legal challenge from, I believe, one of uh, Hillary Clinton's 2016 lawyers, very well funded, very well paid. And even if the challenge is meritless, the fact of having to go to court, hire lawyers and defend it saps the resources of these upstart third parties who barely have enough money to hire people to go out and collect the signatures to, in the first place. And they ended up being vindicated in their ballot efforts. But at what cost? If ultimately you don't have any resources left to run a campaign, this is how the Democratic Party and the Republican Party as well, but I'm focusing here on the Democrats, have because they're the ones that are targeting the Greens, has, keep themselves mm. with a political monopoly in this country. So I'm looking up, I, I wanted to 
prove the point I was making earlier. I look, this is actually an article in our publication, The Hill. Yeah. This is an opinion piece. This isn't the perspective of The <laughs> Hill. Uh, but talking about how in 2020, um, saying that, yes, had there been no jo Joe Jorgensen, she was the Libertarian Party candidate, would Trump have been reelected? Um, in Arizona, the margin of victory for Biden was just about 20,000 votes. Jorgensen got 50,000 votes in Arizona. Um, similar stories in a couple of other places. Um, Georgia, there, in, in Georgia, Georgia, remember, there was actually, uh, or no, no, that was, sorry, that was the midterm. Well, that happened too. One of those, there were so many Senate races in Georgia <laughs> in the last four years, I can't even quite remember, but it was the it was the Herschel Walker, mm -hmm. Raphael Warnock race, mm -hmm. where there was actually even a libertarian candidate in the race. Mm -hmm. We may have interviewed him. Um, I, I can't remember. He, he's seeking the, I think he's running for the Libertarian Party nomination as well. And uh, he got, he was getting attacked so much by Republicans mm -hmm. because that margin was so close mm -hmm. and he was actually in that race and uh, they were like, drop out, what are you doing? And he was like, no, I don't care. And and to be fair, the, the National Party absolutely had his back. Mm -hmm. Libertarian Party was like, uh, we, we don't care if we help elect Raphael Warnock or Herschel Walker, neither of them represent any of our policies. We have no preference between the two. Um, be, you know, because sometimes Angela McCardle and other leaders of the Libertarian Party will say, well, at least if there is a Republican who is speaking to some libertarian issues or is a little bit better on some issues, do we really want to hurt them if they're, you know, better mm -hmm. than the average, uh, but was very steadfastly saying that is clearly not the case in Georgia? Well, the real wild absence in this entire conversation seems to me an absence of talking about ranked choice voting. Mm -hmm, of course, sure. none of this would be an issue if you simply got rid of this first past the post system and had a situation where candidates that did not get to a threshold have their votes attributed to their second place and then their third place and on and on and on. And in fact, some of the liberals who are so focused on the role that Jill Stein did or did not play in 2016, seemed to miss the idea that if they did support ranked choice voting and if ranked choice voting were implemented, including in the primaries, Donald Trump would never even have won the 2016 Republican <laughs> sure. primary if there were sure. a ranked choice voting system. Because remember, he did not get a bare majority. He is someone who is able to succeed with this 30-ish percent of the vote. What would that start to look like if, the, if, if there were ranked choice voting? And, and remember always, why ranked choice voting is so scary to the, the two-party duopoly. If you live in a world where there are no spoilers, what argument then do the Democratic and Republican parties have to coerce you into voting for less than ideal candidates? When they put forward a Trump versus Biden rematch, which very few people in this country want, two historically unpopular candidates with historically low unfavorability rates at this point in the election cycle. What other excuse do you have to nudge people into the polls other than to say, if you don't do this, you're electing the other guy? And ranked choice voting takes that argument completely off the table. Indeed. I also kind of love the posture of, again, the, the, the main Biden pitch, the Democratic Party pitch, being democracy itself yes. is at stake, which is why we are doing everything we humanly possibly can to prevent you from being able to vote from a Biden alternative, whether that is keeping Trump off the ballot, whether that is deploying an army of attorneys to find every allocation, application of relevant election law to keep off our alternatives from the ballot whenever and wherever we can. Democracy is at yes. stake. And don't don't forget the media blackout and the complicity of the establishment media in ignoring the non-Joe Biden named candidates that were participating in this primary. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, one of the people being employed in this effort is the one and only Liz Smith, who uh, lefties will remember as Pete Buttigieg's comms woman. She got a lot of credibility back in 2020 for basically rendering this candidate out of whole cloth. Who He was appeared on every single magazine cover, went from being a no-name to being a real contender in that race, seemingly out of the blue. And she is a real um, vociferous and committed user of Twitter and uh, interacted uh, in ways in, in, with leftists in the online space in ways that few of us will forget. So I'm really interested to see how she's being used in this mm -hmm. effort um, and whether or not this helps Democrats or frankly makes a lot of the public more entrenched in their position that the Democratic Party simply isn't working for their interests. You go, girlfriend. Tomorrow on Rising, that does it for us for the week, I think. Yep. Uh, your Friday hosts will be in. Please make sure to tune in. They've got a great show planned. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you never miss any content. And for those of you who prefer to listen while you're on the move, we're now available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Bye-bye. Take care.